welcome. It's been a little while since we've done this. So really excited to have you, Andrew. Um, I'd love for you to introduce yourself and tell a little bit, tell me a little bit or us a little bit as people log on about who you are and what you do and where you're from and how you got into the industry. So I, I'm Andrew Bishop. Um, I'm the uh, principal engineer for Ag Processing Solutions uh, located in Great Falls, Montana. Um, and we design agricultural processing facilities. Um, you know, we, we typically, we, we focus on oilseed, pulse crops, and, and of course hemp. Um, we uh, have developed some technology with our partner Forsbergs in Thief River Falls, Minnesota for uh, separating um, herd and bast fiber. Um, then we do a lot of work with them as well in the oilseed industry. So we we uh, help design uh, modifications to equipment and uh, help uh, design the entire facilities and, and help uh, streamline the construction process. Um, so our, our background is in big agriculture. I have a, a 2000 acre family farm in North Central Montana that my wife and I live on. Um, and you know, we, we, we love agriculture. We're hemp farmers too. Um, and we recognize the challenges and the, um, the excitement in the industry too. So we, uh, yeah, that's, that's just a little bit about me. Okay. So I get this a lot and I sometimes enjoy hearing it from someone else when other people are talking about hemp or think hemp, right. Um, they immediately go to this bush of that's being grown right or the hemp that's that's being grown that's high resin for cbd is that the type of hemp you're growing and is that typically what you're processing in your facility now yeah so great question um you know hemp can come in a variety of forms as you know uh we, we've done a lot of work with the bush uh, the bushy type three foot tall plants mm -hmm. um we we've we've done a lot of work with the 12 foot tall plants. Um, and then of course the, the plants that are grown for seed as well. Um, on a, my farm specifically, we did grow uh, two different varieties, uh, X59 and Jinma on my farm this past year. And, and something that's kind of remarkable is on three inches of rain, we planted it uh, about May 31st and uh, we only had three inches of rain on it. We're dry land farmers, so we don't have irrigation. Um, the gin moss still got to be 12 feet tall, which I, I can back that up with pictures. It's pretty amazing. So, you know, one thing that I tell everyone in the industry is, you know, we need to challenge what's known. You know, this is a new industry, so we can't just say, oh, well, hemp has to be irrigated. We, we just don't know. It just, you know, we can do a lot of crazy things with agriculture now. And, um, you know, just from my perspective, seeing gin ma grow 12 feet tall on three inches of rain was unbelievable on our place this year. Um, and so then that, of course, brought into it some unique harvesting challenges and we figured that out. Um, and we, uh, of course, are processing um, herd and bast in our uh, sample facility in Montana and then also in Minnesota to send samples for free to everyone around the world that wants to see this, uh, this material um, that we can generate through our processing system and also, you know, help move the industry forward. We've, we've done a lot of work with bioplastics uh, folks and uh, hempcrete, uh, just about everyone, so. Okay, so processing, when you think uh, processing of alfalfa or any of these other um, crops, you know, that you're harvesting, um, mm -hmm. what's the difference? What are you finding to be the biggest challenge or the difference in harvesting, say, alfalfa or a wheat that's really common? Yeah, so, you know, hemp is uh, <laughs> hemp is unique um you know 12 feet tall it, it presents some unique challenges trying to run that through a swather that's meant to harvest you know three foot tall uh wheat plants um and so you know we've come up with some different things um we're actually working on a um a new harvester um with some friends i have that in the midwest um and you know one of the big problems of course is you know most harvesting equipment is meant to harvest three foot tall wheat plants and it just doesn't work the same way. Um, and so like with the combine, so let's just take it, take uh, the uh, fiber varieties, you know, that are 12 feet tall, you know, we need to find a different way to harvest it. Um, and that's, that's one of the things we focused on is saying, 
well, how are we going to harvest this in the most efficient uh, fashion while also taking into account the reading process and making sure that we're, uh, you know, doing things the right way and the most efficient way and above all cost effective too, because I don't want to ask farmers to spend, you know, half a million dollars on equipment if there's no end markets for things. So, um, you know, with, with the, the fiber, that's, that's a whole different bear with uh, the seed, you know, we can kind of, we can kind of do that like we can wheat. So we basically on my farm this year with X59, we cut off the tops with our combine, harvested that, and then uh, came back through with a swather and uh, cut down the stalks. Um, then of course, if, if you're growing for CBD too, you know, we, we, uh, we have a harvester for that as well, where we're actually collecting the trichomes um, that are normally lost um, when you harvest uh, the CBD. And we've actually, you know, we've run, we've run stock from uh, CBD plants, stock from seed plants and, uh, you know, stock from fiber plants. And for us, you know, the big difference that we've seen is the difference in density between um, the, the CBD varieties and the fiber varieties. Um, you know, it kind of makes sense. You have a plant that grows only to three feet tall. That's going to have denser herd than plant that grows 12 feet tall. Um, but some of our partners in the industry that we've worked with have said, you know, it still works well for their, their hempcrete or their animal bedding as well, if it's CBD or, or, uh, fiber variety. So yeah, we, we've done a lot of exciting things with, with that, but the harvesting side, you know, it's, it's. Sometimes you can get overwhelmed by it, but, uh, you know, by talking to the right people, you can really, you know, it's an easier process. And I think a lot of people give it credit for. Okay. Um, I've got a question real quick. A question just came in. It's about yeah. Utah, but I want to ask you a question about the, do you mind walking through what the process looks like when somebody, when, when we're talking about harvesting or processing hemp um, and you say the redding or decorticating, or separating the bast and the herd. What what would those things kind of mean? What does the process look like? Sure. So when when you're uh, let's just take the seed plant. Okay. Say we're say we're growing for seed. Okay. The say we're growing X59 because that's that's a pretty uh, normal variety. Um, so the seed, what we do is we run through the field, chop the top off with a combine, and separate the seed from the rest of the fiber. Um, then we'd come through and we'd lay down the stock, um, you know, either in a windrow or just with a, uh, um, with a sickle bar mower and just lay it straight down in the field and let it ret. Um, traditional decorticators, um, like European decorticators request that you, uh, you know, ret it for a certain amount of time and, and they don't really like the seed plants. Um, anyway. Now, retting means what? Yeah, so redding, redding means laying it in the field for, you know, depending on your environment, you know, anywhere from seven days to three months um, to uh, break down the, the plant and, and help separate the bass from the herd. So that was that was a very, very long answer for a very simple question. So I apologize. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I like the whole thing, but I think that this is a piece that I want to be able to reuse and chop right. this up and share and um, it's something that, yeah, I get asked all the time. And so it's good coming from someone else. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah. And then so after after the plant has been redded, um, you know, for us, seven days is typically plenty. Um, you know, how we break down the plant and separate bass from herd is we pulverize the stock after it's been baled. So we use a bale buster. Um, uh, basically a big tub grinder uh, that you would see at a feedlot. And we break down the the bale and then we separate, um, you know, the, the bass from herd utilizing a series of agitators, classifiers, um, and screeners to do so. And we found a very efficient way to do it and very cost effective way to do it so that folks can get into a, a five ton system for a very small fraction of, of what traditional decortication is costs. Okay, and what's the type of fiber? Something that I really, um, and this is probably, I don't know very much, so I don't know how to ask some of the questions. Sure. I'm curious about the, the quality of fiber, right? The staple length, the diameter, um, where it's going into, right? Textile industry being at the top for quality. Yep. Um, 
you know, that type of system that you have, well, who are you servicing mostly? You know, what yeah. type of new products? That's, that's a fantastic question. You know, the, and it's a hard question to answer right now. Um, and, and I wish it was an easy question to answer, but it's a hard question to answer because this is such a new thing, right? Um, the fiber industry specifically, you know, from my perspective, we've only really seen a big push in this industry for the last like six, six to a year, six months to a year. Um, <laughs> you know, yeah. And so the textile side, you know, the thing that I've learned and heard from folks in the textile industry is they need about two to four inch length fibers that are clean. Um, and clean means 95 plus percent pure clean. Now that's something we can achieve with our system, but it really matters who your textile manufacturer is and your partner in that industry to make sure that we're doing the right thing um, and make sure we're able to spin it, um, spin it and cart it, which is the biggest deal. Um, and some folks, you know, some folks might want a, a different type of uh, fiber than than others. Like if you're going to a wool wool factory versus cotton, you know, there, there's there's differences. And so um, I wish there was a hard and fast rule, but right now there isn't. Hopefully we'll get hopefully we'll get one soon. Um, and then, yeah, then we're course, figuring out. yeah, exactly. And the bask the bask can also be used in the insulation industry. And then we're also working um, with some bioplastics companies um, utilizing the BAST as a, as a reinforcement um, in the in the bioplastic side of things. So, uh, you know, making it structural reinforcement for like uh, rigid plastics, which is really exciting. So that's awesome. What are some of your aha moments or when you really, you know, looked at hemp and said, hey, this is a solution for bioplastics or for any of these items you're seeing that, you know, because I'm sure I would imagine you have a lot of people that are reaching out saying, hey, this is what I want to make. Can you create my, yeah. my fiber or my product that I need? Right? Uh, absolutely. That, you know, that's what we specialize in is is taking taking processing problems and, and uh, applying them. So we, we get customers call us all the time saying, hey, I need this. I need this material how do I get it? And that's, that's what we do um, on a large scale. There's no, you know, there is no one size fits all facility for, for every individual. We have to customize everything to, you know, are you going to be in the bioplastics industry? Are you going to be in the hempcrete industry? Are you going to be in the animal bedding industry? Are you going to try and be in all three? If so, you know, that facility looks a lot different than somebody that's just trying to do bioplastics. Um, and so, you know, for me, you know, I just uh, something that I, I do all the time is, is on the weekends, you know, I, I just sit back and try to think about how we can do things a little bit differently. And, and that's that's how, you know, I came up with a different harvester idea just this last weekend because we've been having some problems developing that. Um, and, you know, it usually comes after a couple of beers and, and sitting sitting in front of my window at the farm and and uh, looking through my binoculars, looking for deer out in the field. That's that's kind of that's how my that's how my aha moments uh, come come about, I guess. I love it. I love it. What are so when we talk about bioplastic, what's this craze? What is the craze for um, either construction material being made out of hemp or uh, bioplastics being made out of hemp? Um, for those that don't know, what what should people be paying attention to? Why should they be listening to, um, yeah. to me, to us, <laughs> pushing this? I feel like I just breathe it down people's neck. <laughs> well, sustainability, I think, is one of the key words for us. Um, you know, whether it's for the construction industry, um, you know, to replace fiberglass insulation with, uh, you know, hemp fiber insulation, like my friends at Hemp Texture are doing, you know, very successfully, um, you know, whether it's the the bioplastic sides to replace petroleum-based bioplastics uh, or petroleum-based plastics with um, hemp-based bioplastics, you know, and I think, I think one of the things that I want to stress to people is it's not, to me, it's, it's not a, you know, we have to take over everything that's going on in the petroleum industry. We need to, what we need to do is be able to use hemp as an ingredient to start that replacement and hopefully work into that in the next five years or so, so that we can, you know, grow it, crawl, walk, run, not, not sprint. Um, and, and I think that we'll all be a little bit more successful if we take that approach and, 
um, you know, that that's that's where I'm really happy to help folks. And and most of the people that we work with in the bioplastics are using it as like a 30 percent ingredient um, in the overall plastic to, to become start to move more sustainable um, and eco based, which I'm, I'm passionate about and um, love to see people doing. OK, so on the business side, this is something that comes up often. Right. Yep. There's a fine yep. line in profitability when we talk sustainability. Yep. Right. Is this something that's sustainable or is it still a big uh, reservation when it comes to some of these larger companies moving over to hemp based products like plastics? Well, that's that's a really great question. And what we've so what I've seen and the reason that we came up with this new system, Mandy, is because what I saw in the industry was um, the decorticators on the market were far too expensive at the capacity that made sense to provide material at a cost that, that made sense to the end user. So in other words, you know, you can't spend $10 million on a decortication line and sell herd for 15 cents a pound. You know, it doesn't really make financial sense to do that. Um, that's why we came up with this new system was, you know, for us to to be able to to um, you know use some American ingenuity to to match what the Europeans are doing at instead of ten million dollars three hundred thousand dollars and be able to say well this capital cost actually makes sense for the price point that we need to be at to really move this industry forward um, for the bioplastic side so you know there there is a price point that makes sense for the end user but what we have to do is is had to do is bring down the capital cost of the equipment um, and processing facility so that people could supply that material at a lower cost to then replace more of, uh, you know, more of the petroleum based products in the industry. Uh, where do you see AI taking place? <laughs> you know, is these, I've read a lot of grants and there's a lot of grants that have come out lately and they all mention artificial intelligence. And I see some of these big facilities in China and India that are ran by AI. You know, where yeah. do you see that being a play, especially here in the States? So, you know, labor is hard to find. Um, and that's that's what we're dealing with right now. Um, you know, it's it's really hard to find right now. Sorry about that. Um, and so what we do when we design facilities is, um, you know, we, we try to take into account utilizing um, automation um, and AI is, is, you know, hand in hand with automation. So basically, you know, we want we want to give folks the opportunity to um, walk around with an iPad and change the machine settings and use robotic palletization, use robotics where it makes sense. Um, but also we want to create good paying jobs for people. We don't want to, you know, we're not in the business of, of, of having people, you know, not have jobs in the industry. What we want to do is create higher paying jobs that are a little more skilled and with automation, you know, that really gives folks the opportunity to do so. And, you know, we, we incorporate automation into our facilities that we design, you know, all day. And, and we, we love that. Um, we love, giving people that that option. You know, some folks don't want to do that. Some folks want to keep things very manual um, and adjust things, you know, by operator. But some people want to go through with an iPad and, and tweak what they're doing. And we like giving people that opportunity. Sure, sure. What do you think the biggest pain point is right now in the industry? Um, I guess when in relation to growth, right? When we talk about, a lot of times I'll talk about the even 30% hemp plastic is a yep. massive change in the carbon footprint, right? Yep. Massive. Yep. Um, yep. And so when I talk about those types of things and people say, well, then why aren't we using it? Why? I mean, it seems so, yeah, it's mind boggling to me that we aren't, right? So when people ask, what's your opinion? Why do you think we're not? Why isn't this something that everybody's using right now and what needs to happen so that we are? It's a huge gap, right? It's mm -hmm. it's pretty simple. Farmers want to grow it. Like farmers are desperate to find another crop that's out there that actually pays the bills. As a farmer myself, you know, we grow winter wheat, we grow spring wheat, we grow barley, we grow pulses, we do all those things and they just don't really pencil that well right now. So farmers want to grow it. The end user wants it 
the big problem is there's not processors that are up and running. We we have to, you know, like I like I tell folks that come to me and, and want to help want me to help them sell seed. I say, guys, you shouldn't be selling seed right now. You should be selling processing facilities because if farmers don't have you know a place to process their crop, they're not going to grow it again. So we need more processors, and as soon as we have more processors, we're going to be we're going to hit the ground running because there's a demand there from large plastics people that want this product in millions of pounds that they just can't meet right now because there's no end product that makes sense for them. Um, you know, the herd that we make out of the system that we designed is absolutely pure. And that's one of the biggest problems with this industry is when you see traditional decorticators from Europe and other places, you have a lot of bast and dust mixed in to the overall herd. Um, you know, we go through a series of air washes to make sure that the, there's only herd. Um, and that comes from our seed background. We can't, you know, when we when we design seed processing facilities, we can't have contaminants because we get, you know, our customers get sued then by yeah. farmers because they have, you know, wild oats in their wheat seed or something. So, you know, everything that we do, we want to keep at a purity standpoint that makes sense for the end user at, at the price point that also makes sense. And when you say the herd, you're talking about the fiber, the long fibers. The herd is the inner core. The bast is the outer core. Sorry, so the, that's yeah, what I meant. The, <laughs> the herd, the herd is like the actual inner core of the plant, and the bast is the outer core. And so, other people understand this is really important in the construction space because the fiber doesn't stick if there's a lot of herd, right? Or the the concrete won't stick or won't bind or won't yeah. set up if it's if it's not clean right exactly. this process is something right a lot of r d and a lot of a lot of discovery that needs to be done now yep. there's grants that have come out right when we talk about this opportunity and the government coming in and saying hey we recognize this piece there has to be a capital injection right this has to happen um, something that I wasn't as passionate about that has really come to light as I've explored the hemp industry is the manufacturing and the jobs and the rural development that comes with opportunity here, right? Where do you think that the government can really step in or um, some of these grants can step in and provide real solutions for the, the supply chain and for, for bringing the industry to light? Yeah, well, you know, first of all, when you talk about rural areas, you know, I, <laughs> this, this could really help a lot of people. Um, you know, for me in North central Montana, we're a pretty depressed economy. I, I live on a farm 21 miles from a town of a hundred people. So I, <laughs> there's, there's not many people more rural than me or that want to see more jobs come into this area and, and help people out. Cause it is, you know, our small towns are getting smaller because our farmers are getting bigger up here and we need to have jobs to to grow our small towns um you know and and what i see is you know this this plant gives gives people that opportunity whether it be for the fiber and you know what i what i tell people all the time is i i don't want you to to you know i don't want to design you a facility that's just focused on one thing because agriculture is so cyclical OK, there's supply and demand, supply and demand, supply and demand, just like we saw last year with CBD. You know, we're talking about herd and bass this year. But next year, if you call me, we're probably going to be talking about hemp parts or, or hemp protein or something like that. So we need to look at this plant holistically and say, how do we utilize the whole plant instead of just bass and herd or CBD or seed? How do we utilize the whole plant to really, you know, have it make sense for the processors, the end users, the farmers, and how we put as much money in the pocket of, of people in rural, rural America to grow those depressed economies. Um, I don't think I answered your question at all. I'm sorry, I was on a soapbox, but. No, I, but I think that you said it, this is where my passion has gone, right? Same yeah. with to labor laws. I had no idea how closely connected hemp would be to labor or to yeah. manufacturing and rural communities and economic development and going back to we can't we won't have any of these commodities or any of these opportunities for new plastics and new cars and new materials if we don't take care of our farmers yeah. right and so i think really that's where it goes back where i'm curious is or i think is 
the government coming in and stepping in, where do they make the biggest impact right now? And is it really around um, processing? You think it is the, the, the supply chain and processing? Yeah, you know, I, I think grants for for processors is really where it makes sense to me. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of really interesting programs that some some of my customers are taking advantage of with in regards to opportunity zones. Um, you know, financing there. Um, you know, I, I think that you know putting together more grants and more funding opportunities for for people that are interested in this is is really where you know the government needs to needs to focus and and uh, you know look at helping people um, build more processing facilities because there's just not enough right now. And there's, there's really no argument in that. There's, if you, if you're growing, you know, a few hundred thousand acres of hemp in the U S or however much we're growing right now, there's just not enough processors for that. It's not even close. So. Well, um, we're going to end up right back where we did, if we're not already like the CBD market. Oh, exactly. The power market. Yep. Right? It is. We had this, influx it did really well and then everybody grew it there were no processors and then we had a bunch of bad product and hemp fortunately for fiber it it you, we can store it longer it doesn't lose its value however if everybody's growing it and it's not being processed then we're just storing it and i know there are hundreds and thousands of pounds and tons <laughs> yeah you know it's it's really interesting mandy the samples i send out all throughout the country and world come from a bale that's three years old from my buddy's place just up the road. And people don't like, everybody says, well, you have to use that within a few months. And it's like, well, I, listen guys, I don't know. You can check out the herd I just sent you. I promise that's three years old. And I, I don't know, I'm not I'm not an expert on the material science side, but it sure as heck looks like herd and bass to me. I don't know. So yeah. it, that, that's one of the things that I get a little frustrated with with this industry, Mandy, is just that, you know, there's there's hard and fast rules in an industry that we don't really know enough to say this is how it has to be. And we have to as as, you know, innovators in this industry and people really, you know, doing things in this industry, we have to challenge what's known. And if we don't challenge what's known, then then, you know, maybe we should find a different industry because we just, we need to make sure that, you know, we're, we're doing things the most cost effective and efficient way um, as processors, as engineers, as seed suppliers, as, as everyone to really grow this industry. So. It's been pretty eye opening to me as we've dove into this and we've had a number of meetings where people have asked questions about standards or certifications or, um, and I'm speaking specifically about fiber right, about the fiber market, because uh, I think it's a whole nother animal when we talk CBD and the cannabinoids, <laughs> right, but on the fiber side, um, and when we talk, each of our uh, products, end products determines what type of fiber, or what type, how much herd, or how much bast, or how long the follicle, or, or how big the diameter needs to be, right, and so um, I think that it's been really fascinating that you go into a grocery store and you pick up a bottle or a box of uh, a, a bottle of ketchup and you know exactly what's in it, right? That doesn't exist in the hemp industry at all. And they're those back down to the standard of or the certification, say, for cotton or wool, right? When I go to buy wool, I put in the quality of wool I want and it's allocated a price based on that quality. And, and that's what you buy. And there's no question you know, how the different types of fiber or how dirty it is or how clean it is or how oily the wool is, it's set. And so I think really where the industry needs so much support is on those standards and certification and, um, you know, that checks and balance place, that place where once it's processed, it goes to a checkpoint, it's graded from there, it's sold based on what you want, right? Um, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I've sent out product to po to people. And when I send product out, you know, we, we've sent thousands upon thousands of free samples out to individuals and companies. And the resounding, you know, the thing that I know the most about in this industry is that no one knows what they want until they see it. <laughs> and um, everybody knows everything. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> That's 100% true. And I just... I think we all have to challenge each other every day. I mean, I, 
if if I hear someone say they know everything about hemp, I'm like, oh, geez, I, <laughs> I good for you. But, uh, you know, we need to work on this all this whole thing together. And, you know, I send you know, I get calls from people saying, hey, I need some, I want I want some samples of Bast. And then I send them samples of herd as well. And they're like, well, actually, I kind of like this herd. Can I get it in this size? And that's what we do. And, and that's that's how we move the industry forward is by, you know, figuring out what people want. And the, re, the resounding thing right now is no one knows what they want. So we have to keep pushing to figure out what people want. You know, I would say I would say the one thing that we do know is the animal bedding industry. You know, that side is pretty well stabilized and they know what they want. Um, you know, my friends at Old Dominion know they've sold a lot of hemp and they know exactly what they want. And, and, and you know, that side of it is, is much more cut and dry than the bioplastic side because some folks want it free flowing. Some folks want it, you know, a certain micron size. Some folks want bigger herd to try. Some folks want small herd. Some, some people want micro bast. It's all over the place. And so it's just, you know, making sure that we tailor a system specifically to the end product is, is what we do and what we love doing. It's awesome. Um, it's been eye opening to me, the difference. I also thought plastic was just plastic. I didn't know that there were, uh, I, I don't even know how many varieties of plastic there are. And so I think that just goes to say that for us to expect that now that hemp's legal, why aren't we all just using it is yeah. we just unraveled a whole handful of real problems that don't exist in other industries. You know, that those have already been outlined and those standard pro processes or procedures have already been outlined. So uh, another piece that I think has been really important, you kind of touched on it a little bit, is in all these other industries, say banking, you have a place where you can get together and you know who else is doing what you're doing, whether you're Googling it, you're searching it. Uh, we have a lot of associations and a couple of larger organizations, but not very many that, is, that really support other associations, right, where we can all come together and say, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've been on a call and somebody has told me they are the biggest and the best or processing the most. And I had just hung up with someone that's doing as much as or more or twice as much as they are. Yeah. And so, so it's been really, you know, I'm really passionate about creating that broadcast platform and creating that um, association where people can come and say, who else is doing it and how do we work together? And instead of everybody holding everything close to their chest, being able to say, hey, this is what worked for me and this is what didn't work for me. And, you know, what what does the industry actually need um, compared to what I think the industry needs? And yeah, so I, no, absolutely. And that, you know, the C, that's that's one of the reasons I think the CBD industry dropped off so so dramatically this year was, you know, no one wants to work together. They all think they have their own you know special thing and and, you know, if we're going to grow an industry, we really need to work together to, to do so. And I think you're absolutely right about, you know, having a, a centralized, you know, association with that. So I think that's great. Well, and as much as I want to say it's one versus the other, um, it's not. Like you said, growing conditions in Montana are very different than growing conditions in Alaska or Florida. Um, and so to expect that one association could accommodate everybody would be silly. However, to be a place where we can aggregate and bring everything together, I think that's what that's what the industry needs in order to move it along and to know that we're on the right path, right? Oh, There's no sense absolutely. In, we both yeah. don't need to be dumping ten million dollars into something that doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I, uh, you know, I, I tell people all the time. I say, you know, I the a processing facility I designed in Florida is going to look a heck of a lot different than a processing facility I designed in Montana, which is going to look a lot different than one I designed in Kentucky, mm -hmm. Indiana, you know, wherever it's, it's all, you know, everything that we do that I see is we need to tailor our systems to what the equipment, the farmers have on in that area, because if we don't do that, we're not only asking a processor to, to pony up, you know, a significant capital amount, we're also asking the farmers too, which is unrealistic, I think, because farmers have been burned by CBD. And so hemp is a dirty word to them right now. So if they can, but if they can do small plots, you know, dip their toe in the water, see how it all goes, you know, I, I think we're gonna be more apt to uh, growing the industry, uh, you know, as a, as a crawl, crawl, walk, run method rather than a sprint method like we saw in the CBD industry last year when we saw a lot of people go all in on hemp because they thought they could make fifty thousand dollars an acre, um, and and now we're looking at more realistic returns, which are 
still very favorable, but um, you know, it's starting to look more like an actual crop. What big companies do you see starting to actually come into the industry? Okay, now there's a difference in in the industry and publicly in the industry or publicly supporting the industry. Because I think that all of them or the majority of them are, are or have already been doing research and looking into it, right? It's it's undeniable evidence at this point that it's a more sustainable crop long term. Yeah. Um, however, yeah, where, who do you see really starting to dip their toe in it and say, hey, we're in it, we're behind this and we, we're going to support it? Yeah, you know, I, I think there's going to be some large textile companies coming in and and really trying to to grow and process here in the U.S. And, and I think that's going to be wonderful. Um, you know, I, I think there's going to be a lot of large ingredient suppliers looking at hemp protein very closely um, and seeing if that fits into their um, to their end products. Um, I, I think. Honestly, I think the ingredient side with hemp seed um, and the protein, um, specifically from the hemp heart, is really where I'm going. I, I think we're going to see a lot of very large corporations come in and utilize that because you know I'm a <laughs> I'm a big plant-based protein guy. Not I, I, I eat a lot of meat, but I, I really believe in it for an industry. Um, and I see, you know, I, I see some of the larger corporations that are in the plant-based foods. And they're starting to look at hemp very closely um, and see that there's some unique benefits to hemp over other plant-based proteins. And I think that's going to be where we see more of the large corporations come in because, you know, those corporations too are a little bit newer and they're not maybe as, uh, you know, scared of, of trying something new as, as some of the other bigger corporations are in, in um, you know, the construction industry or things like that. Right. Um, one thing that I don't think anybody really talks a lot about that probably will or is being um, explored, you know, by companies like Nestle are the sugars. Hemp is a very high sugar, you know, plant and it's hardly discussed at all at its capability to create a hemp based sweetener. I, I, I would bet that, yeah, I would bet that next year we're talking a lot about hemp as an ingredient because that's that's the cyclical nature of, of agriculture right is right now it's it's fiber everyone's talking about fiber and everyone wants to do fiber mm -hmm. um but I, I think next year we're going to see some real movement and move, real traction in that industry well and i bet this goes back to you know i i've read through that grant i've spent a lot of time lately looking through that usda grant and it talks a lot about the food and the agriculture and going back to farm and so keeping our eye back on that and where it's headed, but not where we're at, you know? And I think that even now Utah and I'm sure Montana is the same as we're stuck a lot on the CBD side and we're not even exploring a lot of the fiber side. And now I think really we need to even be moving ahead. And it is like you said, the protein and the sugars and it's pretty exciting. I'm thrilled. I'm yeah. thrilled. So yeah. what, what types of things do you need or how to, how, how can we support you, um, you know, to really make your business grow and, yeah. and the industry in itself? You know, I, I appreciate the question. You know, right now we're just in this, what, what we need is more processors and more money coming into the processing side, large scale hemp stock, uh, hemp fiber, hemp seed processing, um, you know, we just need to see more money put into that industry by, uh, you know, companies that are that are willing to take a shot on hemp because there's there's no doubt. I mean, it's not it's not like a cut and dry. Oh, this makes a lot of sense. Um, sorry about that. Th where this makes a lot of sense, um, you know, capital expenditure because it is a new industry. We just need to to get more people in it and and start producing product in the U.S. and show we can do it and show that you know there's there's end markets for it. And so, you know, for me, you know, we, we just need to see more people really, you know, ponying up and doing this in the U.S. You know, we, we've had some success in Canada, um, but we need to sh we need to show that we're doing it in the U.S. and that people are excited about it and, and want to move forward here. And what's your advice to those people that are looking to invest? And the reason I ask is I've had a number of investors say, hey, I think we should put together an education program for investors 
because how many investors do we know that in the middle of an investor meeting or a pitch pitch event of any kind, they're going to raise their hand and say, I don't understand, right? Instead, they're going to pull back and probably not put money in. And I see this a lot. Um, just recently, I had an opportunity to bring somebody up to look at a mill and there's a lot of information that we just, you don't understand. You, unless you're in the industry and you understand even the simple process of redding and decorticating and, you know, the seed and the bast and the herd and the fiber versus the, um, you know, high resin plants, that, it's a lot of information. And so knowing that big money is ready to come into the industry, but they don't know where to put it or how to put it there. What's some information that you'd give the investing side um, as advice or things to watch for? Yeah, you know, it's, we can make a pretty profound argument with, with the system that we've come up with, um, you know, for people that are interested in, in investing um, as far as what their, what their returns will be. Um, but, you know, my biggest, my biggest advice to people that are looking to do this is, you know, look at the plant holistically. You know, we can't don't put all your eggs in one basket because that's what so many people, uh, you know, really lost a lot of money on last year in CBD. Um, if they would have done a fiber facility at the same time as they were doing a CBD facility, they'd probably still be around to talk about it. Um, so, you know, my advice is 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 don't be, you know, completely centric on one product look at the plant, you know, uh, as a whole plant and, and look at all the uses for it. Um, look at the returns on the investment and the seed side, because that's profound right now. Um, and, and look at the the fiber and the bast as potentially even a byproduct of that seed. Um, and so, you know, that's, I guess that's my best advice to investors is just to don't be so solely focused on one thing, but just look at the numbers, trust the numbers and move forward when it makes sense. Good advice, right? Back to the numbers. <laughs> uh, I just, you know, I think that there's a lot of, a lot of times, and I and I hear this a lot. Uh, sustainability is has not been cost; it's not been profitable. You know, sustainability is typically not a profitability, and I think this is a whole new opportunity to put sustainability and profitability right together and make huge impact. Right. And so I think it really is going to take those impact investors that are long term. It's a long term play. Absolutely. Yeah. So where do you see your next move? Where are you growing and are you looking to move outside of Montana as a business or are you stay stay in Montana? Oh, I, I there, there's no chance I'll leave Montana ever. Um, it's it's uh, I'm a Montana boy through and through on my family farm. You know, we. We, we have great partners in the industry. We have uh, Forsbergs and Colorado Mill Equipment as great partners. They build the equipment that, that we work on together and we design the facility for, you know, for us, you know, we're gonna keep building our team around, um, you know, the different technologies we develop and and uh, work with our partners closely. And, you know, for, for us, we'll, we'll be here in Montana, enjoying the cold winter and uh, enjoying the beautiful summer, so. You know what? I think that there's huge opportunity to build right down the center of the country, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado area, Utah area, a quarter of a corridor of processing facilities, you know, where we have great transportation. It's yeah. Yep. Well, you guys have so many acres. I, I'm from Wyoming and I thought that I lived in a kind of small area and I don't. <laughs> I had borrowed gas twice this weekend coming home from Montana from farmer because I thought, oh, this will be enough. It'll get me to the next town. Yep. But it didn't. The towns are so far apart. So Yes. Yes, they are. They Montana is very rural, but we're uh yeah, we're pretty proud of it too. Um, yeah, you know, for us too, I, I, I do want to make the point that we're designing facilities in the, on the East Coast right now um, and, and all over the country and, and also across the world too. So our, our, with, with the, you know, with how technology is now and how we've all had to become a little bit more remote working, you know, we, we do a lot of Zoom meetings and a lot of FaceTimes with, with processors that we're designing facilities and you know, for us, you know, hemp is just one of the things that we do. We, we're designing um, a couple different pelleting facilities right now, grass seed, um, feed mills, um, you know, a lot of different things. And so for us, we we're not we're not we're not moving. We're not leaving Montana a lot right now, but I do normally travel quite a bit to 
to, to build and design facilities for folks? Um, I, <laughs> I seriously would love to move up to Montana. <laughs> it's a great place. Yeah, it's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful up there. Um, I had one more question for you and I forgot. Yeah. I actually know a gentleman um, from Colorado Mill, so I have to give them a shout out. I think he's actually who connected me to you. And so mm -hmm. I'm glad that, um, yeah, anything else on you, anything else that we can do, anything else that we should share, um, anything that somebody else, let, who else, what, what should people be paying attention to that maybe we didn't mention? Yeah, I, th I think what we just need to do is, uh, as an industry as a whole is build out the supply chain. Let's get this thing rolling um, and start being able to provide product to, uh, you know, manufacturers that want to use these, uh, these end products or, or end users that want to use them. So, um, you know, I just, I just think we need to focus on, on what we're, uh, you know, on, on using hemp as a, you know, ingredient as a, a in just all the different ways we can. Um, and so, you know, I guess that's my, uh, ramp in final words <laughs> what's the volume real quick to leave the volume being requested versus what's actually being processed yeah i mean we have we're working with folks that are ready to write letters of intent or for 10 millions tens of millions of pounds um and in the u.s there's really not anybody coming anywhere close to that production so um we just need to we need to start making that here and yeah, and think about the jobs and everything else that are involved. So, well, yep. I'm I'm super excited. I'd love to have you more involved. I'd love to chat more. I'd love to loop you in on our meetings, our association meetings. For those that aren't aware that are listening, we have an association meeting once a month. Um, it's every third Tuesday at eleven o'clock. I'll send you an invite, Andrew. But I'd love to loop you in. Um, it's casual, great networking, great connecting, but really an opportunity to address some of these concerns and then highlight those that are doing it right in the industry. So, perfect. You feel free to join. I'll send you the link. Other, otherwise, anyone that's listening, you can join at globalassociation.org, and we'll sign off. Other than that, Andrew, thank you very much. I sure appreciate thank your you, time. Okay, have a good day.